So uh, welcome, I'm Peter Bindels. Um, I'm giving a talk about a view to a view. So let's first say, um, this is me, sort of in a similar position, <laughs> somewhat. <laughs> Uh, you can find me on Twitter with DasCandy42. I'm on uh, CPP Lang Slack. You can reach me pretty much anywhere. I wrote uh, Hippomox um, basically like almost 10 years ago, and I gave a presentation last year about that. I've also written CPP dependencies together with a whole lot of people at work, and we released it as open source. There are two presentations on it on Meeting C++. And you can find all the presentations I've given on the GitHub link, including this one. So if you want to follow along with the slides, feel free to download it. I also work for TomTom, Tom, a uh, company that makes navigation software, and this is part of why we have some of these things. And I go by the motto of making the world of C++ simpler. I believe that we have a whole lot of things that are really great, except that they overcomplicate the thing that they're actually trying to do, which makes it inaccessible for people who are new to the language, and we should be a whole lot more user-friendly, newbie-friendly. So in that regard, I wanted to make a presentation explaining about views to views. So first I'm going to be explaining what this presentation is and what it's explicitly not. Uh, then I'll be going over the terminology. I'll be uh, explaining why we want to have views, what views are good for, why we even went in this direction, what kind of views are, and there's quite a lot, how to think with views, when to use them, and in the final end we're going to be making a view. And I figured that given that we're all pretty good at C++, who here thinks that he's not that good? <laughs> That's way more hands than I thought. <laughs> but we'll be fine. You'll be fine. So we're going to make a view, and those are going to be some code samples. I actually made three views. So first of all, what is the goal of this presentation? The idea is that we are going to be talking about the general idea of a view, as in what is a view, why are views there, and the things that we're going to be making are going to be usable now, and they're going to be usable in C++ 98. They are the general concept, which means that they are not ranges v3. They do not rely on concepts. They do not rely on anything that you could only do if you had C++ 11. So in any code base you have, these ideas apply. And that may be useful if you are not able to use ranges v3. For example, from what I know, Visual Studio still does not support ranges v3 or at least the up-to-date version. They have a two-year out-of-date version. It's always focused on practice. I will be giving you uh, code examples, and all of those compile, and they work as intended. And all of those are from something I just happened to need for something, and I just happened to make. And at some point, I realized I have, I have like 20 different views that I made over time in the last year. And at some point, there's a general, a general idea that views are a really good idea. Not all of them are in production, but they're all intended to be essentially production ready. So as I repeat, this is not ranges v3. If you do want to see ranges v3, which is a more complicated solution to the same problem, look at uh, Eric Nibel's talk from CPPCon 2015. But in order not to confuse anything, I will try to keep as close as possible terminology-wise, so we're not confused either way. So the terminology. And one thing we're going to be leaning heavily on is iterators. Ranges are a separate concept, and ranges map to a pair of iterators, which means that we have the types of iterators. So just a small recap, we have input iterators. You can read them, you can increment them, but you cannot do a multiple pass. You cannot make a backup and do it again, because the input maps to something like a stream or something that is volatile that will go away. You can have a forward iterator if it doesn't go away. For example, if you have a file mapping that doesn't want to rewind, and then you can uh, make some algorithms more efficiently, and some algorithms require forward iterators. The next step up is having bidirectional iterators, which means you can do everything that a forward iterator can do, and you can go backwards. This can be useful in most cases, but in some cases going back is prohibitively expensive or almost impossible. There's random access iterators, which do the same thing, but you can index them at any point. And then there's one step above it that is, according to the standard, not strictly above it, which is a contiguous iterator, which says there's a contiguous storage. But you can prove that any contiguous storage will provide random access. So there are sort of an extension upon a random access iterator. And all of these map directly to being a range. So I have an input iterator, it will be an input range. If I have a forward iterator, it will be a forward range. If I have a contiguous uh, range, then I will have a contiguous iterator, essentially, allowing me to access it contiguously. 
and will be a random access iterator. So we have the concepts, and this is just to make sure we're all on the same page for the same names. And this is uh, one of the things that may have tripped up some people. So we have a range, and a range is a concept of multiple T's, multiple things, demarcated by a beginning and an end. And it always is multiple things. We have a view, which is a non-owning type, that refers to a range, so there's multiple items. We have a ref, which is essentially the same thing, except it's explicitly only one thing. So if we have a function, that will be a ref. If we have a string, that will be a view. And beyond that, we have a container, which is an owning thing like a view, except that it stores things. And we have an action, which is like a view, except for some reason it's not efficient to do it as a view, which means that it results in a range of t. It does the same kind of thing that a view does, except it has to actively move things to a new storage location. And in some cases, uh, this is the only way to do something. For some, uh, some algorithms, it's impossible or practically impossible to do as a view. Question. Yes. Does view imply const? Um, not necessarily, but most of the time it would. have a view over a range and reach through that view and modify the thing underneath it. So the comment that Titus made was that in the current proposal, in most views, you can reach through the view to actually modify the underlying container. And for uh, some kinds of views, this is a logical thing, which I'll get to in the, in the next bit. And for some kinds, this is practically impossible, which means that depending on the type of view, you may or may not have that guarantee, but in general, it's possible. So. This is one of the reasons why views are something that we need to expose a lot more to people. This is a message from somebody on the Slack, and he asks, I have a vector, and I would like to map that to some int that I get from the vector. How do I do this? And the way he's asking the question basically says, I want to create a new vector, which is, um, if you haven't heard of the terminology yet, is the xy problem. You have a problem x, and you think that the solution is y, so you're asking people how to do y, when actually your problem was how to do x. So his problem is not that he wants to create a new vector. His problem is that he wants to have the, the int in every of those uh, objects, the attribute of the objects. And that might be better done with a view. The second one that I hit while being uh, working in SG16 is that I am doing Unicode transcoding. So I have a list of uh, Unicode compatible encodings. So the legacy ones, the UTF-16, UTF-8, like 10 variants of them and I want to transcode to any of those. So I can write n times n transcoding functions from UTF-8 to UTF-16, UTF-16 to 32, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, making myself do 144 different implementations, and then finding out that actually somebody wants to add one more, and I'm like, yeah, sure you can do that, but make 23 copies of it and implement them all, which is very, very unfriendly. But if I make this a view, and I take the Unicode reading as one half of it and Unicode writing as the other, I can take any reader and any writer and reduce it to a linear problem. So adding any encoding becomes two things, if I'm using views. And the third one is when you're parsing a file. If I'm reading a file, I have the entire file in memory, typically. There may be multiple files mapped to one thing, and there's ways of dealing with that with views. And if I do this, I am not copying everything. I'm just copying the things I need to. And if you do it correctly, you might be able to get all your tokens referring directly back with string views to the original file, which means you don't need to look up the location of that, which you typically would in a lexer. You can just go back to the original view and ask which of these views has this and what is the line and character offset for an error message if one happens to come up. And I'm not paying for it unless I need that. So the idea of a view is to start with, with maximizing the amount of work that I'm not doing. So the principle of software and performance is that if there's something you can get away with not doing, start by not doing it, and then only do it if you really, really have to. And the second benefit is that my code becomes way more readable, and you'll see that later on in the talk. And sadly, there is a very major downside, which people have found out over the last year, which is that a string view is, for example, non-owning. We now have a standard string view, and it's very, very easy to make mistakes with that. I'll show you one. I'll uh, let you find out if you can find it. It's not the typical example, so it's not as easy as you might think. So 
the idea of maximizing the amount of work not done. Um, say, for example, you have a game. I have a world that is loaded, and I'm trying to render that to the screen. Well, one way of doing that is taking the entire world, shipping it to the GPU, sending everything through the pipeline, and then finding out, actually, this pixel is way off in the distance, and I'm not going to see this. This is something that I would see, but there's a big building in front of it. Somebody closed the door, so all I see is a door. And in that case, the best thing to do is try to find out as soon as possible if you can throw away most of it. So if you look at how a game renders it, it looks a bit like this. And because normally you wouldn't see this happening, because all games do this and nobody's ever noticed this, at least in most good games, this is a different camera point of view. So there is a camera point of view all the way in the bottom right, and it's looking to the left. And you can see that anything that's within its uh, range of view is visible. Anything outside of its field of view is just not sent to a GPU at all. And there's a second thing happening, which is that it knows that it's standing in front of a building. So the entire city behind that building could never be visible, which means that we just stop sending it to the GPU. And now the GPU just gets like five buildings to render and a couple of people. And that's really doable with a high graphic fidelity, which means we can play games on reasonable computers. That's good. And sometimes we can actually do this by skipping things that would normally be kind of crazy. For example, if you're playing Minecraft and you're in a forest fire, the best thing you can do is run away because the forest fire stops as soon as you're far enough away and it doesn't even burn. It's just latently, latently sitting there, not burning, until you get back to it with a bucket of water and then you can extinguish it. And if you log out, I don't need to eat food. I can just not play the game for a year and then come back and I'm still full. It would be very impractical if I didn't, but for a server this means I could just skip doing whole lots of work. And for views, this means that if I'm using a view on an input range, I'm searching for some entry, and I know that at some point I've had enough of them, I found an entry or something, I can get away with just not doing the entire transformation on the input. Instead of taking everybody in the database, pulling them into objects, converting it into the, the entry I want, and then skipping it, I can just skip the entire transformation. And the best thing there is that you can take views, stack them together, combine them, and only pay for it once. I'm only reading the input once, and then my transformations make it into the information I want, and everything in between happens only when I'm actually reading. So I don't have copies, I don't have big buffers. Your program becomes very efficient. And in some cases, the idea is that if you have a transformation that results in a big output and a second transformation that results in a small output, that might be a reason itself to do this. And one example is Unicode transcoding. I have something in UTF-8, it's probably ASCII, which means that I have a single character per input. I transcode it into UTF-32, at least code point wise, which is four bytes per entry. And then I'm saving it as Windows 1252, which is one byte per entry. So if I save that, I'd need five times the space in between just to transcode from a single byte format to another single byte format. And if I do this with a view, I just don't store the intermediate at all, I just transcode it immediately saving memory bandwidth, saving a whole lot of things. And in some cases, you can even use a streaming output. So if you're uh, transcoding things from one source to another one, say you're co converting XML to JSON, you can do that on a multi-gigabyte file streaming without caching anything. So as an example, I have uh, the string transcoding where I have two strings that are in a different uh, encoding. I have a code point 437, which is the default that DOS has, and I have code, uh, something in UTF-8. And the strings are essentially the same thing. But if I want to compare that, I have to make some kind of intermediate representation, usually, to make them comparable. Or I can compare them directly and just make magic happen to make this a comparison that makes sense. When I'm trying to transcode to UTF-16, I can just make it an assignment. And in those cases, I don't convert anything in the first case. I just read from both with a different way of reading them and compare them directly. In the second case, I'm not storing the UTF-32 code points. I'm saving work. The second thing that makes me really happy with views is having a whole lot more readable code. And the idea there is that when you have code, you're trying to express the things you're doing. And what many people have a tendency of doing is instead of expressing the operations you want to do, is to express the actions you want your processor to do. And that means that you're translating your problem domain into your computer domain, which is essentially explaining to the computer what the customer wants. If you do the opposite thing, 
you're explaining to the computer how the customer thinks, and now you can express everything in the language of the customer, which means that in some cases you can actually pull them in and tell them to go read your code to see if it does the right thing. <coughs> I've done that a few times and they found bugs because we had a misunderstanding and he can just read the code as a product manager, which is really, really nice. And again, you can do complicated operations with a stack or a combination of views. And the downside is that we have a lack of ownership. The main thing that C++ has over most other languages is that when I have a string, it owns what it has. If I have a, a unique pointer, it will destruct it at the end of a lifetime. So when I have a unique pointer, it is live. When it's gone, it's gone. There's no intermediate state. There's no garbage collection. There's no, I forgot to do this, or I forgot to unlock a mutex. And that is, in my opinion, one of the biggest powers. It's basically the closing bracket that Herb Sutter likes in a bigger, bigger view. And views don't do this, because if I have a string view, it doesn't own its underlying context. It doesn't control the lifetime. So it's really easy to make a bug. And the biggest one is having a dangling reference. Um, so I have a, an accidental dangling reference. Does anybody spot the error? OK, anybody not working on compilers every day? <laughs> Jens? But why is it a dangling reference? There is a the there's the string view will not own the memory. It's a little it's a temporary constructed string which then is being yes. transferred in the view. You Vittoria? So exactly, it's just that one S that makes this const character pointer into a standard string, which I'm then returning as a string view, which means that the standard string is instructed after <coughs> the semicolon, and I have no, nothing to refer to. So just removing the S would fix this. But there's no warning here. There's nothing detecting this. There's nothing making this hard to do. It's actually really easy to mess up. So as a general API guideline, make them so that this is hard to do. I can't completely prevent it, because people can write code that makes a view and then explicitly returns it while the lifetime is gone. But if you make it easy to essentially not make it easy to make a view out of a, uh, a temporary, that already helps most of these cases. Vittoria? Yes. Yes. So the comment that Vittorio made is that if you have this example, and instead of removing the S, making this a new string view every time, you can make it SV, which also avoids a length call. Titus? Oh, wait. Okay. Yes, uh, Ben. So the comment that uh, Ben makes is that this could be put into a static buffer if the string is long enough to not be small string optimized. I think so, yeah. Um, I actually think that would be a copy then. It couldn't refer back to the original string because this should be a mutable one. Chandler? Chandler? Oh, yes. So it So Chandler comments that it's a use after free either way. And I think that's correct, because the string cannot refer to the original string being input as a copy and write from a uh, static storage. <coughs> so you would get a problem anyway. But again, making this S into nothing or an SV would solve the problem. So the basic principle is to make it hard to do this. And don't try to completely prevent it, because it's basically impossible. People can express the code they want. They can explicitly make a view and then Return it anyway. So, uh, Titus. Do you have an example of doing this, this for you? Um, the quintessential idea would be that you have a string constructor that has, uh, that only takes a, uh, a, a string view constructor that only takes a right hand uh, reference to a string that is deleted, as in just explicitly make it impossible. Every time that someone prevents that, it doesn't work because that prevents you from using string view as a function parameter. Yes. Which is the prime, like the good use case. Exactly. Which is why you can't prevent it. Yes. But right. you can at least try to make it so that it doesn't do that in the use cases you're caring about. And in case of string view, I completely agree. This is not going to help. Okay. I've never seen an example of trying to prevent the dangling views that work. 
maybe there will be one. I must admit that I also haven't tried to make this impossible. Uh, so far, I've been using views as a direct thing to be used in a range-based uh, for loop, or in a different view, of course. So we have views and iterator types. Um, if I make a view over a uh, range, then I typically shouldn't be raising the iterator level. So if I have an input iterator, I shouldn't be making it a forward iterator, because that implies that I'm caching the entire input stream. I would need to to make it work. You can do that, and it will work, but then it's just not a view, it's basically just an action, it's a copy. You can very often have to lower the iterator type. If I have a const, uh, a, um, a sequential storage, a consecutive storage for something, uh, if I make a view over that with some kind of transformation, I cannot make that sequential itself because it's transitive view. I can only make that a bidirectional iterator. If I'm just giving a handle to something that's already stored and I'm not modifying it, which is the case where you have a modifiable uh, reference to the original underlying storage, then it's still consecutive. So the basic views would be consecutive. <coughs> and in some cases, for example, if I'm transcoding from shift yes, which is a, an encoding used in Japan, um, they don't have a unique way of knowing, based on the previous bytes, if you have a single or a double byte uh, character before it. Which means that if I'm incremented beyond one point, the only way of knowing for sure would be to rewind the entire stream and go back to that point again, which is really prohibitively expensive. So the best idea would be to make that impossible because it's a very inefficient thing to do. Um, it can be beneficial in some cases to cache a, sub uh, a subsection of a view. So I've had a tar view, which takes a range of bytes and makes it into a iteratable view of the files in the tar. And in that case, I really want to have some kind of view over the contents of one of those files so I can use that in a different view as in read it as an AR file, read it as an object file, whatever. And the basic idea could be that you have a tar view that takes a byte stream that's bidirectional, or an input stream, for example, from a gzip input, and cache just the file that you're on right now, which means that it's still, in, it's still an input range, but the file that you're exposing is itself consecutive. And in that case, you can cache that, but it does mean that you're caching a big bit of storage in your view. So it's a bit of a trade-off. So then we get to what kinds of views do we have. And there are six kinds of views. So there's a, there's a basic view, which is something that maps directly to a container. There's a generator, which is a view that creates a range out of theoretically thin air, as in we pass in some ints or some numbers, and it generates a huge amount of output. So iota would be one. There's a rope, which is a more complicated construct that is very, very useful. There's a transform there's a filter, and there's a zip style of view. So the basic view is a non-owning reference to somebody else's range. It's standard string view in C++17, standard span, which in my opinion is more generic than string view in C++20. They basically just take a range of consecutive bytes and say this is a span, start end as a single type. The string view says this is a span, basically, start end specific type, and it's a string-like thing. So you can use it in places where you would use a string. We have a generator. It's a thing that's mostly like uh, in functional programming language where you have, for example, an infinite range being a generator. And this can define a whole lot of inputs. You can put them through transformations to make uh, ranges of squared things. You can make the calendar example that Eric Niebler has. But in general, I find this is not a thing that I'm using a lot. I'm mostly using it on some actual input and then transforming it. So it's really funky to show. It allows for really nice code. I know that functional languages do a lot with it, but I haven't found much use for it in production code. And then we have a rope, which in my opinion is one of the biggest things that I've so far not seen used enough. And the rope is a logical concatenation of multiple underlying ranges. Those have to be logically the same type, not physically. And you can take them all together and combine that in a view to make it represent a single range of the same type without copying anything. So for example, if I have three string views, I can concatenate those to make a single string view-esque construct, calling it a rope, and you can read that as if it's a single file or a single string, but it's actually composed of multiple bits. So it's a single range from based on multiple ranges of the same idea. So if I'm, for example, parsing some C++ code, I have a pragma, I have an int, I have an include file, 
uh, another function, a conditional include for some operating system that I happen not to be using, and a class, and the include is on the right. So the first thing I do is take these things, memory map them. Somebody's, the highlighting is not working. So the idea is that I'm memory mapping them, and then I take the parts that I want, which is these parts, put them in a rope together, and now I have a single rope pointing directly to the memory map file that has my entire preprocessed input without making any copies of everything. If I can pass this into a lecture, the lecture has string views into this, which then goes into a parser, which has a AST built up from string views from, you know, five levels down, and all of a sudden you have an AST that points back to your source file for everything. That's a really nice abstraction, but it's actually not new because your network card does this already. And probably, and I'm looking at Bryce for that, your GPU probably does the same thing. When I'm passing in something to send to it, it will have, uh, in the case of a network card, it will have a header and a bit of data, and another header and a bit of data. And the client sends it to me with a single write call of 64K, and I need to intersperse that with headers. So instead of doing that, I'm, I'm making a single uh, gather buffer pointing to a header, and then to the first bit of data, second header, second bit of data, and so on. It's the basic, same, same basic idea. And you can have this in two variants, uh, which is a discussion I had with Zach at some point. You can have an expression template that constructs an, a big type and then at some point takes the entire type and folds it down into a new string at the point of assignment. Or you can have a runtime tree that keeps track of all the bits so that you can modify them in place. And both of these examples are about string. And both of these have the idea that I have a collection that I'm in some way uh, constructing from underlying bits in an efficient way. Then we have transform. And transform is most of the views that you're probably going to be writing. So I have a span, and I'm converting it to a tar file or an AR file. I have UTF-8 data. I can make it UTF-32. I can have a compressed stream, take the uncompressed stream. I can do it vice versa. I can take the uncompressed stream, make it compressed. Stacking views that way. I can escape uh, values. I can unescape them. I can make an HTTP parser out of it. I can just take keys or values from a map, which is a really simple view, but it's one that makes your code a whole lot more readable. I can take a two-string two from a date as a string view, which means that I'm not creating temporary strings to do that. I'm just creating a string view object representing the action of doing that. And I can split a string, taking the string, making parts out of it, making those iteratable without any copies. And then we have a filter. The filter is basically taking the input range and then skipping over the values you don't want to have. This is one that we're going to be implementing. So you can skip duplicates, you can take only prime numbers. Many variants. I'm going to be speeding up a little bit because I think I'm um, just past the halfway point and we still don't have much time left. Uh, and then there's zip. Zip is the last kind. It has multiple ranges that you zip up pairwise to form a tuple and then a range of those kinds of tuples. It's something that's theoretically very important, and I know that there are uses for it, but I just haven't used it yet. So no, no case came up. So the difficult thing is when you have views to views. If I have a string view, it has a begin and an end. And if I make a rope on top of that, it needs to have the begin and end of each of the string views in there. And pre-C++17, those had to be the same type to work in a range-based for loop. So it means that my rope contains two, two iterators for every underlying string view. If I make a rope out of a rope, then the top level rope would have four iterators for every entry in, entry in the bottom, which means that if you go up in abstraction, if you have five levels of abstraction, you have about 97% memory waste, which is a shame. So Eric Niebler proposed to have the ability to make the end iterator a different type, so you can make it a sentinel. The idea of a sentinel is that it's just a tag type that says this is the end, nothing else more interesting. So that makes a view to a view much more interesting. And there is a, uh, a pre-C++17 workaround that I'll be showing later with a whole lot of caveats. It works, but it's, it has risks. So the underlying problem with views is who actually owns what. And if you take a view to a view, the intermediate view may have its own input ranges. So keeping track of what things need to be owned and what things need to be kept alive for the entire view to be constructed and valid that's a much more complicated thing. So in many cases, the question you're asking yourself is, if I have a view, should I store this? Because it implies that the lifetime of this view will be at least as long as the lifetime of everything underneath the view. And in the case of a stack of views, that's a really complicated question to ask. So at some point, you should rather be asking yourself, do I want to store this as a stack of views, or is this the point to convert it back into just a, a normal container? 
So then we have thinking with views. So given an operation, the first question to ask is, can I represent the output as some form of iteratable variant of the input? And if I do that, can I increment that in amortized order one so that it's an efficient view? And in these cases, then a view is probably a solution that you want to take. So to create a view, you make an iterated state that maps your output position to the input, input domain. You make it such that, for example, if you're uh, converting an int to a string, you have some index into how long the string could be, and you make sure you map that back to the original int. Um, you allow constructing it from whatever input you want, so an int or some other kind of valid range of the same type, and given the output position that you can increment, you extract just the value that's there. And there you have a view. And most of these views are actually conceptually something else. So if you're thinking about the int to string, it will return something that's not a string view, it's not a string, it's not any of the things that the string library author thought of, but it still is sort of a string. So actually you want it to be a string-like, and that's most likely where concept is gonna come in to make this really strong. And if you do that, so see ranges v3 for an example, it is very type safe and it's really powerful, but it does mean you're uh, doing a whole lot of work just for type safety. And for many people starting out with the language, having a whole lot of concept, really complicated error messages, at the moment, a whole lot of template work, that can be very, very daunting to figure out why you need to fine and understand all that stuff, just so you can make an, an, a string out of an int. So you cannot do that, and that loses you type safety. It's, it's a trade-off, but it's one that I'm usually willing to make. So when do you use views? That's a really simple uh, answer, just as often as you find a place where it fits. So if I have a graphics scene, I can call objects, or I can parse files, I can destructure some, uh, some complicated thing into views of parts of that, and I can do lazy conversion from one to the other. And it makes my code a whole lot more easy to read and a whole mo lot more representative of what I'm trying to do in the input domain. But you can only do that if you know that the lifetime is gonna be good enough. Everybody has to own the parts that are in there, and there is no way of making a view if you cannot guarantee that the lifetime will be long enough. So let's go to make a view. And the views that I'm making are not ranges v3. They are a simple concept that has no external inputs other than just the code that you're gonna see, which means that they're really easy to explain to people. They're easy to figure out how views work and what they are, but they're not the one that you should be writing when we have ranges and uh, these views in the standard. So think of this basically as a gateway thing to go to actual views. So for new people, this is the nothing up my sleeve. I don't, I'm not hiding anything. I'm just making a really simple class. And the short and simple enough that we can probably do three, even if we only have six minutes. So we're gonna be doing keys, because it's the simplest one to start with, the int as a string, and a simple lambda applying filter. So we start by having a range that we take into the view. We take the begin and end, and we store those for a arbitrary container. And then we have the ability to convert that into the iterator pair. And in this case, I'm cheating because I'm passing back the key view itself as the start iterator, and I just have a sentinel as an end. In this case, I can take the uh, increment operator, just increment the underlying operator, the not equals and equals just forward to the actual iterators, and the dereference does the operation I want, which is to take the key. Does anybody follow this? Any questions so far? Well, that's good. That took about 40 seconds. So that's why we like it. And now our code looks like this. So we have a, string, uh, a map from strings to numbers. We can iterate over all the keys of the numbers and output the key. I don't think I need to explain the code any further. It's, it's basically the same as Python would be. So for a beginner, I like this. And if I have a string split, I can do the same thing. Fedoria? It would uh, not be undefined behavior as far as I know, but I'm looking at the compiler people. As far as I understand, it would be uh, range extended for the entire for loop. Titus? Uh, if you were, <laughs> there's one of the really annoying <coughs> things is uh, the expression on the right hand side of that colon is not lifetime extended for the whole body of the loop. If you are returning a single value from a function, then that's fine. 
Uh, but so if numbers is a temporary being rinsed through your filter, numbers will go out of scope uh, right away. Yes. And so therefore, yeah, we have a problem. And so the comment that Titus makes is that in this case, if numbers would be a, a temporary, then the view, the keys, would be stored in the range-based uh, for loop, but the underlying storage for the, for the R value would not be, and it would not be lifetime extended either according to any rule. And Titus indicates he would really like us to fix that. Chandler seems to be focusing on something else. <laughs> Chandler says no. Chandler says no. I don't think he heard the question, but he says no. <laughs> so let's go to the second one. We have the int view. So I'm taking an int as an input, and I'm pre-incrementing if it's positive, because then I don't want to prefix a minus sign. So I will go to the first point of the actual thing that I want to output. And I store the, n, the uh, input and the index that I'm at. I have the same stuff that I had last time. I have a sentinel. I can return that. I have a comparison. And I check to see if I'm at position 11. Because if, if I take an int, 32-bit, convert it to a string, I have a single character for plus or minus, 10 characters for number, and then I'm done. So I have 11 characters I want to return. That's the end condition. And then returning that basically means if I'm at index 0, I'm either printing a minus or a plus. If I'm in at any index beyond that, I find that digit and print that digit. And if I'm doing a plus plus, I skip all the leading zeros so I can just get the number. So we can lazily convert an int to a string. We can then make a rope out of all those combinations of string-like types and use that. Everybody's following this one? Matt? Uh, Matt is, is remarking that it would seem more efficient to just convert it to a string right as you're doing this, as an action instead of as a view. And well, you know, you can just hold an internal car, of, a car array of tests and then <laughs> feed out the bytes. You could use this. Um, yeah, in this case, you could make it a local copy of the amount of bytes that you want to output. And in this case, it would probably be similar in performance. In ca this case, the compiler sees through most of this and actually inlines nearly the entire view, so you don't have a view left. Uh, maybe one for your talk. So then we can take an int and convert it to a string. And the string is now just uh, the number that we had as a string. The third one's a little bit more complicated. Uh, this is a filter view. So we have basically the inputs. This is all this, the code that's basically the same as the last one. So I have the input begin and I have the sort pointers. I can dereference them, I can compare them. It functions as a view. And the more interesting part comes in when we have the increment operator, where I'm checking for each of the things that I'm not at the end yet, and the predicate matches. So if the predicate matches, or if I'm at the end, then I stop and I just return where I am. And when I'm constructing, I will skip ahead to the first point that actually has something I want to expose. This means that I've eff effectively filtered the input lazily. And this works for any input. So I can take the map that I had before, take the keys from that, apply a filter that says the hash has to be below 42, then take all the references to those keys. And in this case, I'm pretty sure this would still be writable, coming back to Titus's comment, and you can output the key. Um, in the case of a key, you wouldn't be able to write to it, but in the case of the value, you would be able to modify all of those matching some kind of predicate. And there are a few things you can do to cheat. Um, I can make my sentinel the same object as my iterator. And that basically means that I have one object that represents the range, the start iterator, and the sentinel. And my comparisons will only work if you're just using it as a single iterator. So for a range-based for loop, that works. It doesn't have size overhead. You can compose the views. But if somebody actually tries to use it um, as an actual view or a range, that's going to be really horrible. And they're only going to find out at runtime that really doesn't work. Um, you can make your iterator the same as the range, which is a cheat that I've applied everywhere. It avoids a copy, and you can split it off by just removing the ampersand and making a copy yourself. And if anybody tries that uh, to use that differently than you, ha you have been, then it's just going to burn and crash. So any questions so far? Fedorio. How, how are you implementing the rope? For example, if you are concatenating two ranges of different types, wouldn't you get like a variance of each ranges? 
So the question from Victorio is how you implement a rope. And for that, I'm going to uh, basically cut the question short. We are pretty much out of time. Uh, we, uh, you can do that as an expression template. So in a similar case to your futures, and that's the one that I've implemented in my GitHub, which is the middle one here. And you can also do that as a more complicated structure of B trees pointing to essentially a variant of things that could go in there. But a variant has the downside that you can't extend it from outside, for which Louis Dion had a really good solution in his talk just uh, yesterday, I think. The comment from uh, Tony is that Mal Matt Calabrese also has one. I wasn't aware of that. So these are the references I'm going to be sending, which is I have a repository with a bunch of simple view types. All of those are within 50 to 100 lines, and you should be able to read them if you're not familiar with the language. There's S2, which is the Unicode uh, transcoding library I've written, and that does 10 to 12 encodings back and forth with views and ropes. And there's a compiler, uh, which does lexing without preprocessing, which does everything based on string views. So you can make a lazy view over the entire input file and just iterate over it as if it's been parsed or been lexed. I'm also going to be referring to Zach Lane's text library, which has way more Unicode support than I have. I'm only going to code points. He does all the things. I'm going to be referring to Eric Niebler's range v3, which is the full-fledged mathematically complete version of this, which is nice if you have the time to understand and use all of it. So for everybody in this room, this is probably the one you're going to. But if you want to explain how this works, this is the way to explain it. And finally, I want to give a shout out to the CPP Lang Slack, where there are a whole lot of places you can join. You can scan the QR code to get a uh, an invite immediately. And I recommend going to the Learn and the uh, CPP Now channel. Learn is for anybody who wants to learn or anybody who wants to help other people learn. So that is the talk. Thank you.